Welcome to Spooky History. In today's episode, we're getting all Groundhog Day with reincarnation. There are many people who have beliefs and opinions of what happens when you die. Do you go to another place where you sit on a cloud or get toasted like a marshmallow? Do you come back as something or someone else? Or do you just, like the parrot, cease to be? Whatever the case, and it is easy to be flippant, some people have very strong beliefs that they have lived before and will live again. Indeed, many of the world's most prevalent and long-established religions believe as much. Reincarnation is a key tenet of both Hinduism and Buddhism. In recent years, many people who follow neither religion have also become convinced that this isn't their first rodeo. For example, surveys say that around 33% of Americans of all denominations believe it is real, and 29% of those who self-define as Christians. Around 10% of them say they can remember their past lives. Here are just a few tales of other lives. In 2004, a child named Ryan was born in Muscogee, Oklahoma, to Protestant parents Cindy and Kevin Hammonds, a deputy county clerk and a police lieutenant. Life seemed fairly normal until one morning in 2009 when little Ryan had an operation on adenoids that had prevented him speaking in full sentences. After the operation, he started telling his mother elaborate tales of when he was someone else. He told her he had lived in a giant house on a street with the word rock in it, with a swimming pool, movie stars. He had a green car and often went to the beach to get an even suntan on his back and on his legs. His mother tried to find out more and she bought him books with old school movie stars in them. Little Ryan recognised Rita Hayworth and Marilyn Monroe and pointed to a man in the background of one photograph showing the 1932 film Night After Night saying, that's me and I am not the same as the man in the picture on the outside but on the inside I am still that man. Cindy tried to find out who the man was, but could only discover he was an uncredited extra in the film. Ryan told her he worked for an agency where people changed their names a lot, so Cindy decided to do more research on the matter. In 2010, she sent the still to Jim Tucker of the University of Virginia, along with a letter telling him all the things Ryan had said about his previous life. A few weeks later, Jim wrote back and told her he was interested in using Ryan's story on a TV show. Jim had done more research and was fairly sure the man in the photograph was called Marty Martin, a Hollywood agent who died in 1964. In order to test Ryan's memories, he did not tell Cindy what he knew, but instead asked Ryan a series of questions about the life of Martin. Almost everything Ryan told him turned out to be correct, and when Ryan was introduced to one of Martin's daughters, even more details were confirmed. He told his mother afterwards that his daughter had changed. After meeting Martin's daughter, Ryan stopped talking about his past memories altogether and lost interest in any past life he may have had. In 1958 in Turkey, Karen Phil Tutamus was pregnant with her second child, when she had a dream about a man called Selim Fezli, who appeared to her with blood all over his face. She later gave birth to a child called Semi. The child was born with a small, slightly deformed ear. As soon as Semi could talk, he started telling his mother all about when he was called Selim Fezli. He insisted he lived in a nearby village and had been murdered. As soon as he could talk, he wandered to the nearby village by himself and visited Fezli's widow, Katibi, who told him all about her late husband. Semi told her many things that convinced her that he was telling the truth and that he was the reincarnation of her late husband. The little boy recognised her children, called them by their correct names and told them he was their father, even though they were far older than he. Katibi insisted her husband had been killed accidentally, but little Semi insisted it had been deliberate and that he had been shot in the ear by his neighbour, Isa de Beckley, because of an argument about a mule grazing in a field. De Beckley had already been imprisoned for shooting Semi, accident or not, and insisted it was unintentional. But when he was released and came back to the village, Semi saw him and started throwing stones at his head. Though he said he didn't want to kill De Beckley, as then the neighbour might come back and continue the cycle of violence and murder. When Semi was eight, he heard that Katibi had tried to remarry and he angrily confronted her, threatening to kill the new groom and saying, how dare you try to marry another man at the same time as me. Katibi assured the little boy she had no intention of marrying again. She herself died three years later and Semi was inconsolable, crying more about her death than her own children did. 
Born in 1991 in Seattle, little Sonam Wangdu would probably have had the life of a typical American kid, playing baseball and Little League and whatever else little American children are supposed to do. But then he and his mother, Carolyn Hawley, a convert to Tibetan Buddhism, both started having dreams of his life when he was someone far more illustrious. When he was three years old, thanks to these memories, little Sonam was formally recognised in Nepal as the reincarnation of Lama. Oh, different type of Lama. When he was three years old, thanks to these memories, little Sonam was formally recognised in Nepal as the reincarnation of Lama Dejung Rinpoche, who had been born in 1906 and died in 1987. Sonam was presented with a bell and beads that had belonged to the former Lama, mixed in with other religious items that had belonged to other Buddhist monks. He correctly identified the belongings and was convincing enough that the other two possible reincarnations, one from India and one from Canada, were dismissed. For the next few years, his followers had patiently waited for him to come back, so they were quick to recognise him when he arrived in the form of the Seattle toddler. The media started to become aware of him when in 1995, at the age of four, he was about to travel alone to Nepal to spend the next 20 years studying the Dharma and seeking enlightenment. A path that he had started three lives ago as Lama Rinpoche, and had already been reincarnated many times before, starting as Dejung Lungrik Nyama, and had said, I will be born in Seattle, it is nice and clean and fresh. Many people criticised his mother, but in the end, Sonam travelled to the monastery and is still there training for his destiny. Dorothy Lewis Eady was born in South London, Blackheath, Greenwich, at the start of 1904. Her father, Reuben, was a ladies' tailormaker from Wembley, and her mother, Caroline, was born in Lincolnshire, daughter of a plumber. At the age of three, Dorothy fell down a flight of stairs, and when she was brought home from hospital, she started speaking with a strange accent. Though the cynical among us might say that, at the age of three, it is difficult to imagine her vocabulary had really developed much past the stage of telling people she wanted to use her potty. A few years later, she was sent home at Sunday school for comparing Christianity to ancient Egyptian religions and expelled from Dulwich Girls School for refusing to sing along with a hymn that asked God to curse the swart Egyptians. Her parents, clearly noticing that their daughter had a healthy interest in other cultures and, unlike her educators, keen to encourage her enthusiasm, took her to the British Museum. While there, in the New Kingdom Temple exhibits room, Dorothy saw a photograph of how the Temple of Seti looked in modern times and is alleged to have said, there is my home, but where are the trees? Where are the gardens? She went on to believe fervently that she had been a priestess in the temple of Seti and started to call herself Om Seti. For the rest of her life, she had detailed visions of her past life and events from that period in ancient history. She was sent to sanitarium several times, but in the end, people started to just take her visions as real. They were so realistic that she gave archaeologists tip-offs of where to find artefacts, and on the 3rd of March 1956, at the age of 52, she herself became the real-life keeper of the Abydos Temple of Seti I. She is used by believers to justify a belief in reincarnation, as it is said her knowledge and accuracy were inexplicable otherwise. Although reading a lot of books, a vivid imagination, lucky guesses, along with a bump on the head at a developmental stage, might go some way to countering that. Australian Gerald Glaskin wrote a number of short novels and speculative fiction under the name G.M. Glaskin, as well as being responsible for the pseudonymously written classic gay novel No End to the Way, under the name Neville Jackson. That novel was banned in Australia. Crikey! He also developed the Christos experiment, a method to conjure reincarnation experiences by using visual exercises, stimulation of the pineal gland, and relaxing foot massages. <laughs> Genki. All conducted with a soothing guide asking a series of questions along the way. The technique is described as not hypnotism, though that is a matter of definitions. Glaskin and his friends conducted a series of experiments where they would undergo the technique and narrate their experiences. Almost invariably, they would describe scenes of their past lives. Glaskin wrote down the tales in a series of books, which also gave a description of how anyone reading could recreate these experiences. Indeed, the writer of this particular spooky history, Elise, conducted some of these themselves when they were at college. 
The resulting experiences ranged from a girl who said she had been crushed under a carriage horse, a man lost on Omaha Beach during a battle who kept repeating the word Duluth, a servant girl crushed by a falling cupboard, and a young 18th century French cartographer waiting for a ship that would take him to his family's plantation in Saint-Domingue. These were conducted on drama students, so make your own conclusions there. Glaskin himself was convinced of the veracity of these tales and the out-of-body and past-life experiences that were produced. Whether the experiment produces lucid dreaming, deep relaxation, or actual honest-to-goodness reincarnation is… who knows? What you do get is a nice foot massage and a chance to lie down, which can't be that bad. Although, as with all slightly dodgy procedures, perhaps a word of caution should be said as not everyone will respond well to a buzzy head and a demand to reach into your deep psyche. From my own personal experience, I have a slightly odd tale to tell. When my brother was about four or five years old, we were in a car with my grandparents and we were going off on holiday, somewhere that they had frequently gone and somewhere where my grandmother's late twin brother Pete used to live. Now Mike, my brother, he was born after Pete had died. When we were driving through this area of the country, my grandmother was wondering where a phone box might be because she needed to make a call, at which point my brother said, oh, if you just go around the corner, you'll find one there. And we turned the corner, and we did. My grandmother and my grandfather were both gobsmacked, believing that actually my brother may well be the reincarnation of my grandmother's late twin. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Spooky History. Hit the bell icon and subscribe to be notified of new videos, and you can support us on Patreon from just £1 or $1 a month at patreon.com forward slash thenoisyghosts. Thanks for watching, and please do have nightmares. Goodbye.